So I just want to invite one little grounding breath um, by to get, sort of like catch our breath as we launch into this very rich next hour in a bit. Um, and then <clears throat> starting with sort of a little, a keynote, or I think of it as a key setting from me, just setting what key we're in for this next couple of days. Um, and then we'll be going to breakouts for these Partech projects that have happened and people are presenting on them. There's a list of summaries in the shared notes on the left and we'll sort of uh, um, cross that bridge when we get to it with a little more detail, but that's the gist of what's happening. We'll have those breakouts and we'll come back for a quick little huddle and then and a little preview of tomorrow. And, and then it'll be a wrap. So, all right, so without further ado, I just invite you to all take a breath and sort of an easy breath and just natural what comes and what goes. And then maybe one more, a little bit in unison, let it come and go. All right. Carissa, back to you. Okay, so um, in our light, before we do the break, the break is, my, is there an echo? There is. Okay. Uh, let's just see. I think that's better. Okay. So I'm going to give Rochelle a little introduction before the breakout. She's going to be giving us a talk and then we'll go into that. So here we go. Rochelle and I met about a decade ago when she was doing her MA in Integral Theory and I was doing my MA in Integral Psychology at JFK University in California. It might have been Istanbul, Turkey, where we first met at an Integral Without Borders uh, event. And uh, so that was wonderful and so long ago it feels like she has since completed the generating transformative change leadership program through pacific integral and uh just going over back over her thesis in her ma was on the ethics of attention which has really been a foundation for a lot of her work i think i just i love the work that she did there she's been an integral part of the development of the human data commons as ed and advisor to the board and the design and facilitation of Partech. Uh, these four iterations, this is our fourth time. It's been such a delight to work with her these four years. Um, Rochelle has been thoroughly steeped in the intersection of tech ethics and consciousness, which she's going to be sharing more about in her breakout session after this, but for now, what she's bringing to us is a nuanced conversation about sustainability equity and the hard question of ethics. So let's welcome Rochelle to the e-podium. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! Thank you. Thank you, Carissa. Yeah, that was delightful to sort of remember to some of our adventures together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to um, touch in on some themes that I think the year 2020 has brought a little more uh, to the fore in this sense of being a little in the eye of the storm. Um, and uh, this, uh, yeah, I think this year has probably largely gone not how people expected. You know, if you, if you were visioning at New Year's, uh, probably things aren't, were not where that, in some ways, where that vision was. So. Um, so I think when it comes to ethics and that word can get a bit sort of overused, I think, but I think the, the core in a way of the moment that we're at, and I think especially with sort of the combination of starting 2020 with the Australian bushfires and the sort of physical sustainability of the world, and then, you know, coming into the sort of racial 
um, sort of in a way really the veil coming off a lot of the the racial kind of it's like there's been a bad ecology racially um, for a long time and and that it feels like that's really in our faces as well that that there's been um, so but what that sort of brings brings round in terms of so I'll, I'll connect kind of sustainability and equity um, at a certain point but but the starting question that I think for this and framing um, that I wanted to touch into is like what do you do when when you think you set out to make things better um, like coming to a new land and and you know when people first came to America and, and Canada and figured they were going to make things better. And this happens in tech too. We want to make the world a better place. And then you find out that you're the bad, you know, you've kind of been the bad guy or, or the thing that you did actually was really harmful, you know, to some people in spite of your best efforts and best intentions. And there's sort of like a cognitive way that we can respond to that, you know, and, and, and explanations and stuff like that but there's also a place where you know that feeling when you just realize like oh you know even like you just you got it wrong you know you, you so i think that feeling and, and the challenge it gives to our identity as like a good person um it i think that really plays into equity and sustainability um so I guess the a question too would be like, what what can we learn from sustainability that sort of informs informs us around equity? <clears throat> so if you think about the physical world and the pollution and so on, the that's kind of the result of externalizing costs. And I'm going to assume that we sort of roughly get what that means. Um, that externalized costs um yeah it, you can always check it out if that's not a familiar term for you but basically like the waste pollution garbage it's sort of like some someone else somewhere else will sort of pay for it and that could be future generations as well as just sort of exporting our garbage to somewhere else for example so, um, so I was kind of about like, why do we do this? You know, like what makes it like compelling to sort of get the, get the goody now and sort of push the cost away. And, and one thing and sort of linking into identity is sort of status. Like if you can, you know, I know this is a bit of a wild ride here, like where is she going with this? But if you can stick with it, I think it will come around, I hope, you know. So it's so status, like I thought about it in a in a wealthy country, it's like we're so busy that it, it, making good on all the opportunities that we often we don't have time for things like preparing our own food from scratch, for example. So it becomes a thing like getting packaged stuff, prepackaged stuff is almost like a necessity in order to sort of keep up with, with time for other opportunities. Now, if, if you're in a less wealthy country, there can be this sense like of, of mimicking like, oh, it, in wealthier countries, people buy all this packaged food. So it becomes like a status thing to have like some, you know, packaged junk food as opposed to actually really healthy food made from scratch, for example. And so it's not about necessarily nutrition as it is about sort of status and the drivers or the, the conditions in each country. So, so it's not, it's not just what's practical, what we, you know, something as simple as what we buy to eat, but, but there's a lot of sort of structural influences and social significance to these choices or habits and norms. So the, you know, one of the things from that is that 
um, with this status, it's like, so how does that relate to tech, for example? Well, you know, what is your status is one of the things that gets asked um, or, you know, on Facebook or something like that, your status. And then the way that translates also is in like likes or followers or friends number of views, that sort of thing. So we can we can start to amass, you know, um, and amass, um, you know, a bit of being seen, um, having our identity confirmed as significant because we have so many followers. So it kind of shapes, like this text starts to shape what we might communicate um, with others. So we start to communicate in order to get likes or followers, you know, that, and that's a strong influence over communicating to really connect and reveal ourselves in a, in a shared kind of intimacy. Um, so it puts pressure, there's this, you know, it, it, the social platforms especially put pressure and shape kind of our relationships with each other and how we go about them, which is maybe to get more sort of notice um, from others in these various forms. And it can kind of like lose its meaningfulness a little bit. So, so then another sort of weird phenomenon that's happened is this idea of ghosting. So on the one hand, we have amassing a bunch of followers, da 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 da. And then there's this kind of counter and connectivity is huge, but then there's this countercurrent to like, to relationships being sort of very disposable and cancel culture. And it's sort of like when you amass so much of something that, that it becomes easy to just sort of like slough off some of it, you know? And so you can kind of see relationally this amassing and then kind of disposableness and in, in the physical world, you know, amassing wealth and then just disposing of all our garbage. There's a kind of, you know, there's a kind of, I mean, just enough for me to, to think, what, uh, you know, what's going on there, I wonder. So, um, oh yeah, so shaped. And then this, you know, idea of uh, it's not enough for us to have an experience we have to, you know, have other people see that we had the experience and like it. Um, and then cancel culture. So there's this flip-flop between amassing and disposability that I would say in the same way that in the physical world, you know, you get, you know, at a certain point you have so much stuff and you're like, oh, I got to clean out my house. And, you know, you have the garbage bags full of stuff that you never use um, and, and you can just dispose of it. But that's, you know, part of that unsustainable um, in the physical world. And then we have relationally, technology has provided these platforms where we can also amass sort of relationships of a certain type, but then there's also this flip side of, of you know, disposable relationships and ghosting and things like that. So I, the good news, I would say, is that it's not that we're assholes, I don't think, you know, for the most part that we do this or, or that we're flawed or, or anything like that. But, um, but for the most part, just, it's just really hard actually to live in community, not just per proximity, but to actually endure with each other in community with ties, bonds, obligations, trusts, betrayals, um, you know, rifts, histories, being irritated with each other, just getting bored of each other. It's like, it's kind of demanding, you know, to, to be in relationship. In the same way, probably growing all your own food and being like, you know, truly zero carbon footprint is like demanding. So, um, and, you know, so it's demanding also because there's, there's just some really hard skills for relating and relationship that we don't focus on maybe as much as we could in our culture and schools and places like that. So, so how all this kind of loops back to ethics is that like, if someone calls
calls you out for having caused harm or, you know, it just happens that by birth, you or you're part of a class that hurts another class of people that it's, it's, um, you know, that's a relationally challenging thing to do, um, to, to not have someone just get into such a defended place that they can really receive what's being said, but also receiving when, when you realize you do have something maybe to be ashamed of, or, you know, so we're actually talking about like shame and belonging, you know, is, is being threatened when we're called out to a higher ethic. So that's kind of the, you know, that's the hard work of ethics, you know, and, and I, cause I thought, why doesn't it happen more? Why aren't people more excited about it? Why don't people like, why aren't we doing better at it? And it struck me, it's like, well, it's cause it's hard, you know, and it's not just hard cognitively, which sure it is, it's complex, but also just like, like personally and relationally as a human, it's very, it's very vulnerable. You know, if you, if you call something out and get fired for it, you know, you're, you're sort of vulnerable. You lose your workmates, you lose your job and the esteem. So there's a lot at risk. There's a lot at stake. And so how, so creating environments where it's more, it's more the norm and it's more supported and we have the skills to, to receive when we're being called out or called in um, and work with that, I think is, is sort of the, one of the horizons um, that, in terms of the world that might come after this kind of 2020, basically.